Thanks, everyone, um, for being here, for tuning in, for the invitation, uh, the attention, etc. Um, a bit of uh, throat clearing before we begin. Uh, a few things here. Um, one uh, is the content warning. Um, so there will be uh, a time or two if you squint, you know, and, and you kind of know what you're looking for. Uh, you could probably make out a female presenting nipple. Um, and there will also be, probably more importantly, because it's not nice to surprise people with uh, some Nazi imagery, um, nothing graphic, uh, you know, but if that's if you're at work or whatever, you, you don't necessarily, uh, whatever your reasons are, um, just be aware that that's something uh, that's coming up. Um, and while we're on the, the subject, you know, I would say that this, this presents a tiny bit of a, a difficulty for me, this talk, um, in the sense that, you know, as someone trained in religious studies, uh, you know, we're often given this kind of imperative, this sort of anthropological imperative. You want to be sympathetic to the subject, uh, try to see things from their point of view, present it in a way that they would recognize. Um, I'm going to try to do that. And uh, that, I think, is a little, uh, it's a little fraught in this particular case. Um, for reasons that we'll see. I don't want to overplay it just yet, but uh, let me go ahead and just say, in case there's any um, lingering uh, doubt or doubt that may emerge, um, that I think that right-wing ideology uh, is uh, maybe even something that stands outside of the usual sort of uh, academic protocols. Uh, it's something that's a concern to all of us. Uh, it's dangerous and uh, it must be posed, cannot be salvaged or uh, really ignored. Um, also at our peril. Um, so on the other hand, you know, uh, one wants to allow a general sense for the notion um, that people evolve. Uh, we want to take the arguments that they make um, in good faith. We want to leave space even for things like irony and parody and, uh, and performance, uh, while also acknowledging that that is also a, like a standard you know, plausible deniability tactic that one sees, uh, particularly with the right in current uh, conditions. Um, so uh, that's that's that. Um, just we'll bear it in mind. We'll come back to it. You'll see why. Um, but uh, on the other hand, while opposing the the right, I think is everybody's business. Uh, one thing uh, that I want to also make clear here is I am not the Buddhist police. So what we're not doing here is going through and I'm going to pick out and say, well, you got this bit wrong. You misinterpreted that word. Um, that's just not what um, I have any real interest in doing. I don't think that Buddhism has any political um, entanglements that come along with it, right? You can look easily enough in Sri Lanka and Burma and places like that and find all kinds of crazy Buddhist nationalism and things that um, we might not necessarily, uh, well, I might not necessarily like very much. Um, so uh, the general operating principle that um, I think we're going, I'm going to proceed along here is that if people say that they're Buddhists, that's good enough for me. We're going to treat them like Buddhists um, and try to interpret what they're doing as part of that uh, sort of cultural formation. Having said that, um, what I what I want to suggest here is that um, the people that we're looking at are interesting for a cluster of reasons. I mean, the story itself, the, the, um, you know, it's a wild ride in some ways, and, uh, and I'll try to truncate it as much as is possible without taking all the fun out of it. Um, but, uh, you know, this is not a, a biological treatment of influential cultural figures. Uh, you know, the teachings are interesting and idiosyncratic, but um, what I really want us to do is think of these as a case study, their, their implications I think more or less for these three uh, categories that uh, we often try to use to parse uh, the phenomena that we encounter um, in religious studies. And uh, what I want to suggest here actually is that, you know, to give the whole uh, story away here, but that what we're looking at um, in the end is a kind of is a, an unusual form of traditionalism that is filtered through some ideas about Tantra, the left-hand path, um, and Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and so we usually think of traditionalism as being uh, this phenomenon that 
uh, we associate more maybe with some Sufi orders or perhaps uh, with Catholicism or nowadays with you know, Orthodox Christianity, a uh, certain degree with, uh, with Hinduism. We don't normally think of it as having to do with so-called left-hand paths. So um, the people that we're looking at are going to use some of these ideas and combine them in interesting ways. And I think um, the implications for us uh, in terms of how then do we use these categories uh, is that's what I want to sort of have us focus on. And I'll say that the particular approaches that they exemplify um, might well be, and I think are, we can maybe bring that up in the Q&A if you want, found separately in a number of different other cases. Um, so it's the combination here that, that, makes, the, um, that makes the sauce. Um, a methodological note here is that some of this is extremely uh, tricky. Uh, it's work in progress, and I'm still kind of trying to piece some of this together. Um, it's difficult because A, you've got these esoteric orders, uh, which they're a part of. Um, some of whom have public information, others have not. Some of it's probably also blinds and things like that we have to be aware of. Um, more difficult still, in a way, is that we're looking at two people who are a couple for most of this time. Uh, they, they wind up uh, founding uh, an esoteric order and, and things like that later on. Um, but especially in the time period that, that, at least for my purposes, is the most interesting one, that is to say, you know, the first decade or so um, of the 21st century, uh, they more or less sort of go radio silent. Uh, so uh, there, what we have, and in, in, especially in that time period, is kind of pieced together from uh, interviews, kind of assuming that more or less they're on the same page, uh, because they seem to be, at least as far as we know, up until about 2015 or so, um, when they got divorced, uh, amicably, it seems. Um, but there's kind of a, there's a problem in some ways, and I just acknowledge it up front, that I'm kind of assuming that each one of them more or less speaks for the other, except in some places where I can flag and say I'm pretty sure um, they're on a, a, a different page. Um, another issue here is that a lot of what we're getting is interviews that are happening far after the fact where they're explaining what's going on previously. Um, and as anyone sort of who thinks about this for very long knows, those are notoriously unreliable. We tend to overcode those things. We tend to fit them into the, um, you know, the exigencies of the day. Uh, anyone does. There's no way around that. Um, but it tends to be a little um, perhaps overdetermined. Uh, one of them uh, the, does more media than the other, so we have to contend with some of that as well. Um, so, with having said all that. Um, the, let's uh, let's get to the, the fun stuff here. What we're talking about here, the reason um, that it seems reasonable to focus in on these uh, two figures, who at present I think have only about, last I understand it, maybe 400 or something uh, devotees in their in their movement that they run out of Berlin, um, is because we're talking about the world's most famous ex-Satanist, and not my point. No, um, well, a little joke for those of you who grew up in like evangelical circles and. It, he was a, a fun guy. Move on. Um, so no, we're talking about uh, Zina, uh, now Zina Shrek, uh, born Zina Louvet, uh, seen here at her baptism, her satanic baptism in 1967, first person ever uh, baptized, uh, or at least the youngest person, I guess, ever baptized into the Church of Satan. So there's dear old dad uh, next to her. Um, and I found a picture with the uh, the altars uh, draped. So uh, you're welcome for that one, at least. Um, and here she is in kind of a promo glamour shot um, with uh, in front of the, the Baphomet uh, sort of goat's head thing that they use. Um, I think probably you're reasonably familiar with the Church of Satan's uh, generalized ideology, but I want to go ahead and uh, I'll just make one uh, quick uh, very, very quick and dirty um, summation of this, which is to say that at least as far as LeVay represents it, um, at least as far as what's public, uh, we're talking about a materialist organization, an atheist organization. The, the devil is a symbol of rebellion against social norms and structures. Um, they advocates individualism and hedonism. He really likes Ayn Rand. Uh, Large chunks of the Satanic Bible are 
basically lifted from Ragnar Redbeard's Might is Right. So there's a whole lot of social Darwinism and all that fun stuff um, that's already in the mix. Um, so, you know, we might not think of them as the most sympathetic figures per se. Um, there's also the matter of sort of goofy hats, but that's all religions really. Um, but how do you make these guys extremely sympathetic? Um, well, really all you need is the satanic panic of the 1980s, uh, during which time everything from you know, rock music to like weird fake uh, recovered memory child abuse scandals and Dungeons and Dragons with, with Tom Hanks, all of this stuff is going to turn you into a Satanist serial murderer. Um, and in the US during this time period, um, this was a giant uh, industry and the cops were really uh, were really big into it and it was a whole a whole thing. Now um, apparently because the so much of this was pinned on the supposed Satanist called this is like you know QAnon in beta mode, right? So the Satanists uh, that are running the society uh, and making these problems, eventually uh, it seems, at least as she tells it, Zena realizes that the Church of Satan is not sending anyone out to counter this propaganda. And so she says, like, why don't we have a PR person? And, and Dad says, well, why don't you do it? So she agrees, and she goes on the talk show circuit, um, mostly uh, being um, you know, presented with lots of sort of idiocy by Geraldo Rivera and, um, and these kinds of figures, and responding um, in pretty clear ways, uh, in, one, in some ways, to sort of expounding um, the satanic ideology uh, as uh, she inherited it, uh, but also sort of pointing out uh, all the various ways that the uh, ritual abuse narratives don't really make sense. And in fact, they're not even, um, they don't do sacrifices at all, much less the children, uh, they're big on animal rights and the ecology and this kind of thing. So um, she's on this circuit, um, made such of a mark of it that. Um, if you remember this one, this was a fun little uh, thing that popped back up again a couple of years ago, saying that Taylor Swift uh, is a clone of Xena. So that's another nice little uh, thing. Rabbit hole fall down. Um, so having got her onto the, pic, uh, onto the page, we have now um, the question of uh, Nicholas Schreck, is the other major figure that we're going to be dealing with today. Born uh, Barry Dublin, or Dublin. Uh, he takes his name Shrek being German for terror. Um, he's a lifelong occultist. Uh, he's practicing Zen meditation. He's young. He's doing some stuff with the Typhonian OTO in London, chaos magic stuff. He takes, uh, as he reports it, initiation into some kind of a Kali tradition uh, in 1983 or so. Um, but where he enters our story basically is that he, uh, as he claims, he has some experience in Egypt where he's, uh, in 1983, he's thinking of uh, just sort of leaving and uh, leaving the US and going to Egypt, he's gonna study magic uh, and do this thing. Uh, and he hears what he understands to be the voice of the god Set that tells him, don't be a coward, go back and fight. And he understands this means that he needs to go back to the US and fight the forces of Reaganism and the sort of satanic panic. And how is he going to do that? Uh, he's going to do this by forming a sort of a campy horror rock band uh, called Radio Werewolf, um, which is named after the Nazi resistance station that was behind uh, Allied Lines. Um, and uh, he's going to try to embody everything that the satanic panic fears. Basically, they want a villain, he's going to give them a villain. Um, so part of what that means, though, of course, uh, at least in his case, why it necessarily have to be this way, but in his case, um, it means embracing um, this kind of, um, at least a, as a part of a performance art or a ritual or both. Um, maybe he's also serious about it, we don't know. Uh, some ideas about uh, Nazi occultism, and you can see here um, where he, um, it's attributed to him this idea that the uh, the Nazi leaders were occultists and trying to restore uh, the natural order, the, the order of nature. Okay, so possibly this is just kind of a you know a thin white Duke persona for for Reagan's America. He also moved to Berlin, kind of when he's done with it. 
Um, so a lot of it supposedly black humor and parody. Um, and if he's asked about it now, often does not really get into it too much under the rationale of not sort of explaining art too much because he takes the, you want to leave it up to interpretation. Um, so we can come back to some of that uh, in a bit. There's what seems to start out as the, basically the fan club for this band. They're kind of, they do reasonably well for themselves in Los Angeles. Um, and initially there's what's called the uh, Radio Werewolf Youth Party. And this spins out in a couple of years, 1984 anyway, um, it seems that he founds what he calls the Werewolf Order, um, which is a continuation of that. And the Werewolf Order will actually outlive the band. Um, the band more or less stops in, in 93 and the, the order continues through 99. Um, so you can see their uh, manifesto uh, here, which I just sort of pulled from the internet. Uh, it's all about opposing uh, Judeo-Christian tyranny and things like that. Um, you can see some pretty obvious, um, at least sort of uh, fascistic uh, imagery and things like that that are, that are part of the deal here. Um, but potentially, you know, it's not so different from anything that a number of other bands at the time were doing. We have a fan club that's kind of like the Temple of Psychic Youth is arguably a psychic TV fan club and things like that, right? So maybe it's just sort of part of the, the act, who knows? Um, the other thing that he's really big into uh, is that he's kind of a Manson truther. Um, and this is the thing that's going to continue through to this day. Um, he and Xena seem to first uh, really collaborate um, at this 8888 uh, event. Uh, for those of you who haven't, you're not hip to all this, right? 88 is, uh, it, H is the eighth letter of the alphabet, so then you get 88 is Heil Hitler um, in that kind of a, of a code. You don't even really have to dig that deep because Boyd Rice is involved um, and is notorious uh, as a Satanist, fascist kind of guy. Um, but uh, his take, Ray Manson, by the way, I haven't dug too deep into this. I don't have, a, I'm kind of agnostic about the, the general thing here, but um, his opinion, as far as Manson goes, as best I understand it, is basically that Manson was not, uh, that Manson was, was framed to a large degree. Uh, was also sort of made a villain in a way that uh, it, Manson, he says, was basically uh, responsible for helping to cover up some murders that were more or less just a drug deal gone bad. And all the helter skelter, starting a race war stuff, all that kind of stuff, um, it was just something that was kind of a, um, a red herring to try to throw people off the scent. It worked reasonably well in Hollywood circle the wagons. Um, but basically, uh, that Manson is not responsible for any of these, these murders necessarily. Uh, in fact, he's going to wind up kind of in the position uh, that Manson is kind of uh, a, a mystic. Um, so this is, a, this is art um, by... Uh, Nicholas Schreck for the uh, the film, Charles Manson Superstar, lots of interviews with him. You can see him kind of depicted here as if he were uh, a Hindu or a Buddhist uh, deity. Um, there's a, a book that was first, uh, came out in uh, 88 or 89, the film and the book came out on the same time. This has been continuously uh, uh, revised, um, called The Manson File, in which you kind of get the idea here that outlaw shaman here we have art by Zena. She's kind of on the same trip. So they're, they're good friends with, with Manson, or were good friends with Manson. Um, and under the impression that in some ways, uh, he was a really misunderstood character and was kind of, um, that some of the uh, things that he came to, the conclusions that he came to about, uh, you know, cosmology and things like that were in fact uh, legitimate um, reflections of a, uh, a primal, uh, truth that's embedded in various uh, religious esoteric traditions, Gnosticism and things like that, particularly. Okay, so. Uh, so here's a little video from, or a gift, as we're from the uh, 8888 rally. You can see Boyd Rice up here with all of his uh, Nazi gear. I give you this one to point out something here. Nicholas Schreck seems to have been very, very loosely affiliated with Church of Satan. Um, it doesn't seem that he ever really bought into it. Um, as a, the way that they tell the story anyway, uh, he tried to interview LeVay for a book that he was writing on occultism, and LeVay gave him, as he did sometimes to anybody that he wanted to impress, like a, you're now an honorary member of Church of Satan card. Um, and so 
So he never really bought into it. The reason I give you this is says, uh, you know, I don't worship a character in Infernal Regions with horns on his head and a tail. Nicholas Shrek is very clear when he talks about these things. He was a devil worshiper. He was a theistic Satanist. So he's not into the Church of Satan kind of thing. He's a, he's a real um, occultist uh, during this period. So um, we'll see how this sort of shakes out. However, uh, the Radio Werewolf Order, or sorry, the Werewolf Order, as it were, um, does seem to, I mean, if they're playing a role, they're, they're playing it to the hilt. Um, so here you can see, uh, this is taken at the 888 rally, and a lot of these figures uh, will be uh, recognizable to some of you. Boyd Rice is over here, Zena, Nicholas. Uh, this is the, the guy from the American Front, which is kind of the um, American counterpart of the National Front. Um, there are some, you know, anti-Semitic cartoonists and other figures that you might uh, be interested in potentially. Um, I'll point out, in the in in terms of the argument that the Radio Werewolf was an act, um, here's the the drummer, so-called Evil Willem, and he's one of the only guys in the thing, maybe the only guy who's not doing the salute. He's actually got his like hand with his beer mug up there, so you can see it's definitely not him. He's going to leave like pretty soon after this, and he leaves, so he says, because he, he, he gets the impression that not everybody in the audience is understanding the joke. He thinks that they're taking it literally, and it's supposed to be black humor or something. Um, so uh, the werewolf order and radio werewolf are going to be basically Nicholas and Zena after that. The two things that they say that they, they're very keen for people that aren't into uh, explaining their art and what they're all about to just to distance themselves from psychic youth and OTO and all this stuff. And they want to direct people to the Church of Satan and White Aryan Resistance. It's Tom Mechter's outfit. He was a Grand Dragon of the KKK in California and had a public uh, access TV show. And uh, Nicholas has a habit of going on the show um, simultaneously saying things like that the, they transcend politics with the werewolf order and that they're going to make uh, Nazi Germany look like kindergarten. So kind of, you know, uh, you can, uh, it's hard to pin down. Um, one more example of the kind of explaining that we'll give you here. And again, hard to know what we're meant to take seriously or what could be uh, erotic. Um, this is the, uh, I don't know how well, how easy it is to read it from here. Maybe it's pretty, pretty tough. Um, the back of the album, Bring Me the Head of Geraldo Rivera. Um, and it's basically a, a little um, blurb about how all they want is peace and love and everybody, all the races and everybody to get along and, and human rights. Um, and so that was 1990, 1991. Uh, they released this statement uh, about their political beliefs where they basically subscribe to uh, what, if you know what you're looking for, is a, a Julius Evola inspired idea of uh, apolitical. They're going to present themselves as apolitical in this um, in this sense. So more on Ebola in a minute. Um, that does not mean, however, even if they're presenting themselves as apolitical, even if there's all this fluffy bunny kind of thing over here, um, that they are off the Nazi occultism. Oh no. In fact, uh, 1992, uh, they're going to go on, a, at least Zena uh, books this tour of, of Germany to all these sort of sacred sites. She goes to Devilsburg. Uh, castle, the one with the big, the famous kind of black sun uh, on the floor, goes down into uh, the crypt. So this was Himmler's, you know, sort of castle, Himmler's Camelot, they called it, right? Um, and she's trying to, she tries to do some kind of ritual down there uh, to understand something about the Grail quest. Um, so she's actually not the only person, you know, uh, to do this, but. Um, she, she has clarified at various points that what she's interested in is not the humans who were involved with so-called Teutonic uh, occult orders, but the eternal phenomena which they encountered. Um, so that's kind of going to be their argument. And, and Shrek will, Nicholas Shrek will say the same thing. He's, he was interested in Nazism in the Third Reich because he was interested in the religious ideas and not the political ones. All right. Um, funny thing, who else uh, do you know that might be interested in Nazi occultism, and in particular in Wevelsburg. Um, that's going to bring you to the central set in Michael Aquino. Uh, you can probably pull this from the uh, um, 
the video afterwards if you want to get a closer look at the thing here. But he also does a, a working um, in uh, the early 80s at Bell Um So what I want to, this is a good point to sort of um, break and have a closer look at the timeline now, because now we're properly into sort of post-Satanist territory. And here we, I mean, post in the sense, uh, more or less, that Kenneth Granholm um, has, uh, has used the term uh, in the sense that it is a, a sort of a lineal descendant uh, in some ways, um, that it, it comes out of that, uh, that scene. Um, so what we have here, and just to kind of uh, give you the, the truncated sort of timeline, as you might imagine, um, but is the real uh, werewolf order runs through uh, 99 or so. In the uh, interim there, around 1990, when they both leave the uh, Church of Satan, or she leaves and he just kind of stops being around, um, she was never, never really a part of it, um, she becomes initiated into some form of Shakta Hinduism. Um, a few years later, they're going to join the Temple of Set. A few years after that, uh, after she becomes also high priestess then uh, of the Temple of Set, as she had been in the, in the Church of Satan, uh, she will leave, uh, they both leave the uh, Temple of Set and form their own movement. And this is around the same time that they make their conversion to Tibetan Buddhism. So, um, let's uh, let's spin this um, out here. Let's quickly um, kind of deal with the the question of the Shakta Hinduism. Um, so, without getting uh, too uh, deep into it uh, just now, uh, Shakta Hinduism is a tradition within Hinduism that treats the goddess as the uh, most important, uh, the fundamental power in the universe. So here you can see there's a form of the goddess Kali being uh, you know worshipped by uh, the other sort of main, the so-called Hindu trinity, right? So the creator and the preserver and the destroyer, um, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, uh, these Hindu gods are basically there sort of uh, paying uh, their respects to uh, the goddess. And you can see there's all kinds of sort of, um, not in most, but maybe not all of these uh, traditions, uh, there's a tendency towards um, often sort of shocking imagery in one way or another. As the battlefields, cremation grounds, uh, often these goddesses are heavily armed, or they have, um, you know, accoutrement of, uh, you know, necklaces of skulls and, and things like that. So, when she takes, uh, she becomes involved in this. Uh, they don't really talk about this stuff very much, actually. So um, it's it's hard to know exactly. Um, but she, there's a way in which these Shakta traditions are very closely allied um, in a Hindu context with what we call Tantra. And by Tantra, we don't mean anything that really has to do with, uh, it's not necessarily about sex at all, um, but it's something more, uh, more or less comparable to theurgy. Uh, where there's the use of mantras and these sort of uh, diagrams, they're called yantras. Uh, you invoke a deity um, or evoke a deity either in the yantra or in the body. Sometimes you have a combination of the two, you project one onto the other. Um, presumably, if it's anything remotely sort of normal, what she would have taken initiation to is something where there's a combination of these kinds of techniques um, with devotional techniques. And so I give you uh, this image here with, with Kali in front of, or uh, rather behind um, this figure of Ramakrishna, who is a, a famous 19th century saint, um, who really popularized uh, to a large degree, uh, especially in the West, uh, this idea of devotion to the goddess just as a mother, as a benevolent mother. And sure, you know, there's the skulls and stuff, but like it's mom, so you're not really like afraid of her or anything, right? So um, that's just sort of how she is. So presumably, uh, this is kind of what uh, they start doing um, in, the, in the very early 90s. Uh, there's also within this uh, Kundalini Yoga as part of it, usually sometimes you get these ritualized transgressions uh, with intoxicants or uh, sometimes sexual rights, uh, sometimes human remains. Uh, courting impurity is a way of uh, realizing or um, displaying uh, non-dualism and a tendency towards uh, the perennial philosophy of sorts. Ram Krishna himself says he practices at various points uh, Islam, he practices Christianity, he declares that all this stuff works. It always all paths up the same mountain, so to speak. All right, so, um, Quickly, I'll just point out that there are any number of reasons why they might not talk about this too much. This stuff is chock-a-block through 
the kind of occult scene, you got your Kali tarot cards, any number of other um, traditions by things that are either sort of syncretic or people who supposedly went and took initiation to these and then broke all of their oaths and published you know, all the secrets. Um, people have been on about this stuff since Crowley and then Dadaji and Kenneth Grant and his disciples. Um, the sort of Kali traditions are, are very much uh, part of the, uh, almost part of the mainstream uh, in occult circles nowadays. So um, we'll leave those for the moment. Although I'll point out, this is still part of her repertoire as well. Uh, Tina does these sort of Kali devotional songs, um, at least as, as recently as uh, 2017, as part of sort of public ritual performances. All right, so circling back to the Temple of Seth, um, just in case you don't know about these guys, it's, we have, uh, it's started by um, Michael Aquino, Aquino uh, this guy here that's not Sammy Davis Jr or uh, Anton LeVay. Um, he is uh, part of the group that in 1975, uh, they get sort of annoyed with uh, Anton LeVay. Uh, they accuse him of simony, which is kind of funny on its own, like selling uh, orders, uh, selling holy orders in the Church of Satan. Uh, they say it's kind of lost its, its luster. Um, and they break off. Equino gets a message, which he interprets um, as being from the god Set, who says that he's no longer willing to be identified with Satan, um, and instructs him to form uh, his own order. That they're going to continue to do uh, this work. So you can see Michael and his wife Lilith, uh, partner Lilith, I guess, um, with the, the Setian gear. So they're going to basically go hardcore back uh, into occult territory for this. The funny thing that happens here um, is that uh, when he does that, it's going to lead him back to Crowley. Um, so you may probably, you all know, Crowley has this uh, message that he thinks that he receives from a number of Egyptian deities, 1904, that heralds the beginning of the new aeon of, uh, of Horus, more or less, or of Hippocrates. Um, he records this all uh, in the Book of the Law. And when Aquino uh, has his Book of Coming Forth by Night, as he calls it, um, his message from Set, which of course declares him the, the new ma the magus of the new Aeon of Set. Um, one of the ways that he does that is he try he claims that he decodes this passage um, from the uh, from Book Two of the Book of the Law. Um, this random string of numbers that you know many people have tried to uh, to decipher. Um, he uses a very basic alphanumeric thing here, but. Uh, just in first century air, Aquino breaking keys by Dr. Denton today. It's not really grammatical, um, but you get the idea. And this is going to be the new word of the aeon instead of the now. It's Kepper, Kepper, um, so the coming. Um, and uh, this is going to set now, uh, no pun intended, um, uh, a new continuation of the Church of Satan and a new era which now begins. Uh, they back they backdated the founding of the Church of Satan as the era of Set. In this idea, by the way, uh, Set and Horus, who were traditionally opposed, they they merge, or Set reabsorbs uh, Horus. Or however you want to think about that, but um, the, that's how he explains how it was that he was speaking um, in Crowley's Book of the Law. So, and also I should point out that by Set, it winds up being the case that they mean a whole range of kind of discordant uh, trickster gods, uh, antagonistic gods, and they so they can draw in a bunch of different practices uh, into the thing that they use with the, um, the Temple of Set. A funny uh, footnote here that will come back uh, into play in a little bit. The Babylon working, if you've seen Strange Angel, you're familiar with this idea, Jack Parsons, the Jeff Repulsion guy, um, and L. Ron Hubbard, go out into the forest, or the forest, into the desert, rather, um, in 46. Um, and uh, they do some kind of a ritual with uh, Enochian um, keys and masturbation and some things like that, and supposedly uh, invoke the goddess Babylon. Uh, Parsons' plan was to impregnate this goddess with the Antichrist um, and bring out his own new Aeon. Uh, Crowley concludes this idea. But uh, Aquino uh, comes around with the claim, though, that he was born precisely nine months after this happened. And he's got his, like, his horned eyebrow things. Um, so this makes him, uh, he's the product of the Babylon working. 
All right, so apparently the Shreks are totally into this. 1995, they join the Temple of Set. They're still kind of on their uh, publicity tours. They're sparring with um, with uh, televangelists like Bob Larson. Um, they're working through the various suborders. Nicholas Haslam's working on yoga. Um, and as I mentioned before, by 2002, he's in this high priestess and gets pushed out or resigns. And they leave to found their own thing. So here we get to sort of it now the, the content. That was a whole lot of setup. Um, same time, they published this book. And this book, of course, tends to be uh, a manual uh, to left hand pass sex magic. In fact, there's very little by way of sort of practical instruction here. There's a lot of, it's more theory um, than it is instruction. Basically, it's three parts. There's this kind of a theoretical part, one where they go through a list of different traditions in the West and sort of try to decide whether they fit into the left-hand path or not, based on these criteria they've established. Um, and then the third part, which is the practical instruction, which they really kind of don't really give you very much. Um, so obviously, this book is something they've been working on during the 90s. So it doesn't really push Buddhism at all. Uh, in fact, it has a few critiques of Buddhism. But um, if you look at the uh, generate a word cloud from it, um, and if you look at this, what you'll actually see um, is that despite the fact that they're going to spend a whole lot of time critiquing these guys, uh, what you find is a lot of Crowley, a lot of Royce, um, OTO figures, Parsons is in there quite substantially, um, and then Hindu, uh, some Hindu tantric uh, terms. So uh, this is kind of what they're on about. Um, before we, you know, his name doesn't appear here, but uh, I have to point out that the book is dedicated to Julius Evola, and I think Actually, this is really kind of the, the it's a key uh, feature in what's going on here. Um, so Evola, um, if you're not familiar with him, uh, is a traditionalist, an Italian traditionalist um, in the model of René Guénon. Um, traditionalism, uh, I'm just going to go with Cedric's uh, sort of definition here, um, is the, uh, the sense that there was a uh, practices that were transmitted from, you know, dawn of time or should have been transmitted to the West and were not because something went wrong in the second half uh, of the second millennium. I mean, now that the West is in decline because of this loss of transmission of the eternal tradition. Um, and so everything that looks like progress in modernity is in fact decline. Um, and what that means uh, is for some people that they should go off and join Sufi orders and things like that. What that means for Ebola, at least initially, um, is that you should launch a fascist revolution and try to restore pagan Europe. Uh, he tries to convince Mussolini to do this. Mussolini's not a great fan necessarily. He tries to go and then convince the Nazis to do this. They think he's also a little like extreme. Um, but he eventually kind of comes into favor and out of favor, back and forth, um, survives the war. And by the time we get into the 60s anyway, um, he's come around to this idea of being apolitical. Um, in order to sort of focus on one's own uh, development. Um, the other thing that comes that's a little interesting here um, that we're going to see develop is that the traditionalists hold something that's kind of like the perennial philosophy. Um, so as a rule, there's a notion that all the world religious traditions, some of them would like to make an exception for Christianity, at least as a, in its current form, have at its, some, at its esoteric core some, they're really all kind of about the same thing, um, to do that, you have to prioritize experience over doctrine, because obviously doctrinally they're nowhere near on the same plane. But um, if you look at it from some kind of experiential, uh, phenomenological, supposedly vantage point, um, they're on the same thing. Most of these, most traditionalists would assert that you need, in order to access this, though, to find one tradition and stick to it. Evola is not of that sort. Evola, in fact, um, he's into all kinds of things. Um, from Buddhism and Shakta Tantra, alchemy, the Holy Grail, Roman paganism, et cetera. Um, this is kind of what distinguishes him. And I think in many ways, this sets a template for what uh, the Shreks are going to do in their own uh, sort of traditionalist uh, development here. So very quickly, they develop, they set out essential principles of the left-hand path as they understand it. This is going to be different from Blavatsky's left-hand path or any of the other ones that you might have encountered. Uh, also kind of different from even uh, Granholm's uh, ideas of the left-hand path, if you're familiar with those. Um, transformation of human consciousness 
through the manipulation of sexual currents and physical and subtle bodies through erotic rites. And so that, uh, that's one thing they're going to uh, be looking at here. Um, they're deliberately basing this on country or on very certain, very particular kinds of country traditions. Um, but they want to specify they're not pushing country as such, it's just the oldest and probably only continuous left hand path tradition. Um, and sometimes you might need to adapt these for modern contexts. But so they're into kind of kundalini yoga, uh, erotic rites, and um, they give a wide berth to it, doesn't have to be heterosexual, but um, in fact, they suggest that uh, BDSM might be most productive for Westerners because it's got to have to be about sort of shocking your system in certain ways. Um, so there's the um, exaltation of the female principle, by which usually seems to mean a female initiatrix. initiatrix. Um, but they want to, they're very want to make a clear sense that this is not feminist because they're not into egalitarianism. Um, antinomianism. Um, but, you know, the traditional antinomian things that you might do in Tantra, alcohol and meat and things like that aren't really going to be too, too much, uh, too exciting for a lot of Westerners. Um, so they suggest that you find other ways to break your own sort of uh, taboos and or uh, court public shame. It's elitist, essentially. Um, and lastly, uh, they want to uh, they want to make a claim that it's really not about you know absorption into the infinite or any of that kind of thing, um, but uh, where you you shed your ego and reconfigure it uh, in the sort of divinized way. All right, so um, I think we're probably running low on time. One of the things they do then they kind of go through and they uh, set out different orders. As to whether they uh, whether they fit here, the the OTO doesn't fit partially because even though they've now converted to Buddhism, even though they're trying to reorient themselves supposedly away from the Western tradition uh, or so-called Western esotericism in various ways, um, they still maintain this kind of solar masculine solar lunar feminine uh, dichotomy. Um, but they do uh, they vary into they're interested in Babylon. Uh, they identify with this uh, Babylonian goddess of the night. They also uh, seem to have some notion that Marjorie Cameron, when she turns up at the OTO Lodge after the uh, Babylon working, is herself an incarnation of Babylon. Um, and uh, in fact, her appearance is sort of what heralds um, the, the social revolutions of the 1960s. Um, so this set, the pair then of Set and Ishtar, if we take this as Ishtar, so Ishtar slash Babylon, how do you want to think of that? And Set uh, become the sort of uh, the patron um, deities or the central uh, figures in the pantheon of this new movement, which they launch called the Storm, uh, which becomes later on the Set the Liberation Movement. But Zena as its high priest. So they're still kind of doing also this aeonic thinking thing, where like there's a presiding deity of the aeon, and she's the, the high priest of this. So, um, there is a, there's some mixed messages nowadays. It's hard to sort of know. And, um, and again, I'm piecing this together. There's very little that's sort of been uh, published about this. Um, there's a Malin Fitcher at Stockholm who's written a little bit on Kundalini uh, in the Seth Liberation Movement. Um, yeah, Hugh Urban and Kenneth Branham with little portions of articles uh, devoted to this, but uh, it's, there's nothing sort of uh, broadly speaking uh, that explains it all. Um, it seems like partially what's going on though now is that they claim that uh, the set is actually Yahweh and or Allah uh, and or Yaldav. So that he's the he's the presiding deity of the age, but he's also the sort of uh, the demiurge, the Gnostic demiurge. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of see how that shakes out in a bit. So they're doing this thing. Um, and somewhere around 2002 or 2003, uh, Nicholas is doing his meditation, and the goddess Kali tells him that he needs to convert to Buddhism, which maybe seems a little strange. Uh, he, he approaches a Buddhist monk about it. The Buddhist monk says, oh yeah, Kali converted to Buddhism long ago. Um, the Indians and Tibetans have done this as well. Um, so they have uh, Krodha Kali in this Tibetan form here. Um, they convert uh, to Buddhism, Zina, you know, presumably for her own uh, reasons. Um, the Satyan liber liberation movement, um, either then or later on, 
and winds up incorporating a lot of tantric elements. So it's Greek magical papyri stuff set with some kind of tantric yoga things. And the liberation in question winds up being liberation from uh, cyclic existence, from samsara, uh, from uh, uncontrollable reincarnation. So they join with the uh, Tibetan Buddhist uh, Kagyu school, which is the school of oral transmission, um, the, the school that emphasizes practice over doctrine, which also kind of makes sense if you think they're op operating out of this Evolian uh, framework. Uh, this school uses a lot of the same techniques that you would find in Hindu tantric uh, traditions or tantric Buddhism does the same kinds of things. You have these mandalas that kind of like the yantras. Um, you have the transgressive practices of various sorts. Uh, you have goddesses alone and with consorts. You have rituals with uh, human remains for implements. Um, the three figures that might be of particular uh, interest if you're kind of looking at, uh, at these people in particular are uh, Mila Repa. They're, they're kind of interested in him. Part of what he's famous for is for having been a black magician himself, so called black magician, who like killed a whole village with a hailstorm and then later on, uh, you know, becomes a, a Buddhist master. Um, you have the, the current, at least. They take a position uh, on which of these guys is the current karmapa, the, the head of the lineage. Um, and you have here Chogim Trumpa, um, who is important for our purposes because he exemplifies what uh, often in the Kagyu schools in, in particular and some related um, adjunct schools is a kind of what they call crazy wisdom. So Trumpa, if you're not familiar with this guy, is a, is a Buddhist teacher in the US, but very eccentric. So he would just show up like blasted on sake and like, you know, crash his sports car into a tree and come in and demand that everybody strip. And then, you know, like, but all the while he's sort of giving like apparently somewhat lucid Buddhist teachings. Um, so uh, this mode of being uh, a very antinomian uh, is something that they might uh, appreciate about him, although they say uh, he had some mixed results. All right. So where does this leave us? They come to a, a place where there's a kind of a blended tradition. And this image of the altar that I sort of uh, started off with, you know, you can see the set is up here, the various statues of set, the various Buddhas, uh, there's a Kali tucked away back in there um, as well. Um, there's a, it's a sort of a hybrid thing here. Um, Zina uh, in a column that she wrote or is an interview um, with Vice Magazine at one point, um, Likens, uh, she sort of compares Set to what's called the Dharmapala, which are these local, uh, not always local, but with these deities that protect the secrecy of the tradition. They make sure that anybody that breaks their oaths gets what's coming to them. Sort of these wrathful figures that are um, that are considered protectors of the, of the Buddhist tradition. So she sort of suggests that that's kind of uh, what uh, Set is like, that he is um, he cuts through illusion and self-deceit. Um, and so this kind of subjects you to your initiatory sort of ordeal um, and doesn't let you get away with anything. She, uh, she says that she has cleared all this uh, with um, one of her teachers that sort of uh, explains to her how uh, she can do the Sethian thing and the Buddhist thing without uh, contradicting uh, one or the other. Um, she also uh, mentions this teacher as one of her uh, major uh, influences. Um, and I've included this one just because I picked it up from various uh, little speech patterns uh, and uh, turns of phrase that's clear. Uh, Berzin is another uh, Buddhist teacher um, in Berlin that it's clear uh, that she has spent a lot of time uh, listening to. He uses some of his very sort of uh, distinct translations. OK, so she's on the scene now. She's doing various teachings. Um, I, I, I hate to do, be the guy to do this, but she's, a, she's also doing a thing with the singing gold, which is just like a tchotchke for, for um, But so uh, she's doing teaching for the second thing. She's doing also apparently more straightforward Buddhist teachings uh, at this Buddhist center in Berlin. And uh, in art, performance art, music, how do you want to think of it, um, that consists largely of ritual. Nicholas is doing kind of some of the same things, although uh, you kind of see blurry in the background here, a similar sort of setup with the altar. He's got Mila Repa here. One thing I'll point out, both of what they're doing is they're, they're using these mantras in a very public way. 
these things which are meant to be entirely uh, secret. Um, so there's a there's some some questions about how um, the the art aspect of it relates to the practical aspect of it. Uh, Nicholas is still is more active on social media um, and still on the Manson thing. When Manson dies, he sort of uh, asks people to recite mantras to help uh, Manson to a favorable rebirth. And on their website, you know, they're still selling all the all the stuff. You got new calendars. You got old school Church of Satan Zena and Manson teas and Zena with Christopher Lee on a coffee mug, um, and even a new uh, sort of back catalog stuff of Radio Werewolf, ugly titled "The Vinyl Solution." So they're not really trying to memory hold the sort of like all the Nazi kind of stuff. Um, they they kind of keep that. Um, they're still working on that. Maybe there's some economic incentives involved. Uh, when asked about this sort of thing, at most they sort of say, well, yeah, so some of it was like not so great, but it's part of the journey, you know. Um, so the, re the real thing I want to sort of then, the question becomes, what distinguishes this kind of conversion, uh, and whether we want to use that word, from others, uh, people who became Buddhists who had significant background uh, in occultism? So one thinks of Lubatsky and Olcott um, in 1880, or Alan Bennett. And around 1900, you have Alexander David Neal, another um, theosophist, Walter Evans Vence, another theosophist. Uh, these are all sort of very influential figures. Um, and even more recently, as we use John Merton Reynolds. Um, so we have a number of these kinds of people uh, that move from an, an, an explicitly occult context into a Buddhist context. Or sometimes they don't. Sometimes it seems like they kind of incorporate Buddhism into their own system. Um, and so trying to figure out where we place them in this, I think what we actually see here, and I, I suggested this earlier, um, is not so much that it's a synthesis of the Eastern and the Egyptian traditions that's the kind of thing that basically people have been trying to do since you know the Golden Dawn. Um, at least they don't see it that way. Um, and we can, we can ask how much we should really value this kind of subjective uh, identification. But um, I think it's traditionalism in, a, in a, an interesting way. I think what they've done um, is they create a kind of Buddhist traditionalism that's based on this idea of a, of a left-hand path. So instead of just saying it's an esoteric core to all the, all the world's religions, um, they want to say that there's a, what's legitimate is this left-hand path version that has to do with goddess worship breaking norms, and so on. Um, there is, uh, alongside this, other things that like make it pretty clear that they're on about traditionalism, to my thinking, is a real emphasis on lineage, on uh, elitism, a strong emphasis on this idea of it being the Kali Yuga. Um, so it's kind of apocalyptic, uh, declinist notion, um, and a strong sense of anti-modernism. In their case, they're not as worried in, in the same way about things like sexual freedom or um, feminism or many of the other things that like traditional traditionalists uh, would have got excised about, um, but they are very concerned that the modern world is destructive to the environment, the, that it's destructive to uh, the way that people relate to themselves in the state. Um, Shrek is very clear that he's a monarchist and doesn't believe in democracy and that kind of stuff. Um, they're very, uh, very concerned about things like uh, they don't like capitalism too, too very much. Uh, the internet, bad for you, we all know. Um, so they're anti-modern in, a, in a, also a kind of an idiosyncratic way. There's the primacy of experience. There's a consistent emphasis on this language, I think, being initiatory. Um, they're vehement in their denunciation of Western esotericism, which is very much like what Ganon and these people were doing. Like a lot of these guys started out, that basically started their career hating on theosophists and spiritualists. Um, and there's the uh, apolitical thing in the uh, Evolian sense. A few other things we could, we could kind of point to, but um, we'll, we'll leave that there. So if we think of this as a kind of uh, Buddhist traditionalism of a sort, um, what, what does that mean? How else uh, can we try to understand what's going on here? Is it a phenomenon of, uh, to kind of borrow uh, Hodgson's idea of the Islamic, you know, as a, as a way of, a, um, in the venture of Islam, he talks about People don't always necessarily adopt Islam. There's a spread of a culture and sort of paraphernalia around a culture um, that can happen in a gradual way. Is this sort of uh, kind of a Buddhistization uh, process? 
Is it better to think of it as a process than as a you know strict sort of a conversion? Um, do we want to think of the question as converting to something or converting through, converting by means of this kind of west uh, left hand path notion? Um, there's there are also some questions here I want to draw our attention to about um, notions of Western Buddhism or sort of Buddhism in the West. People often um, the literature on the subject likes to, to make this distinctions commonly at least between two forms of Buddhism, sometimes styled as the kind of ethnic and the and white Buddhism or sort of heritage Buddhism or convert Buddhism. Um, I think you know on the one hand this is obviously this would fit sort of into the convert mold, but it doesn't look like what people usually think that looks like. It's not really very sort of Protestant guys rationalistic at all, right? They're very clear about this being kind of a magical project. Um, it's not modernist uh, in the same way as people think of Buddhist modernism, um, it, with the exception of the emphasis on meditation. Um, and I think uh, the other question here has to do with uh, Western esotericism and how we fit people into these categories. So this is the idea that I, I kind of want to end on here. How much of this do we really hang on identification with the tradition, whether the people in question actually identify with the thing? So what I've done here is basically is to say, well, it matters and it doesn't. If they say they're Buddhist, then great. And we'll use those categories to try to understand what they're doing. If they say that they're not doing Western esotericism, I'm sorry, I also don't care. We're going to use those categories to try to understand what they're doing. So I think it's a if the the way that we want to deal with these things, or what I'm suggesting anyway, um, and it's not about authenticity or any of those kinds of issues. It's about highlighting what's the most salient issue at a, a given point. Um, is that we we don't want to police people out of categories, but we also don't necessarily want to allow them to opt out. Right? We want to keep all the, the tools on the on the table. Um, at least that's my way of thinking about it. And the same goes for thinking about this in terms of, uh, of Western esotericism, that it's, uh, I don't think that subjective identification with tradition is as big of an issue, uh, perhaps as it might be um, in other uh, wings of religious studies. Um, but this, the notion of whether it's a location, an orientation, how do we conceptualize it, I think is something that, that does their um, interrogation when you have figures like this who think of themselves as having completely left that scene and yet are at the same time using all this kind of language of the left-hand path and initiatory ordeals and all this. I mean, they're, clearly they're, they're still very immersed in that and how they're thinking. Okay, so um, thank you. I'd like to uh, open up for, for questions uh, or comments uh, um, in that 